So we're recording this afternoon during what is a glorious uh, Tennessee thunderstorm. I love thunderstorms here in Tennessee. And uh, we're in the midst of one right now, so you might get uh, to hear some thunder, you might see a little lightning flash periodically, you might hear some rain hitting the window, flying sideways in the wind and that kind of thing. Just love it. So anyway, I uh, wanted to answer a question today. This comes from Julie, and uh, it is an important question, uh, albeit kind of an uncomfortable topic, and it is, has to do with church discipline. Uh, and taking in particular uh, an episode that takes place in, uh, in Corinth, and here's, uh, I won't read the entire question, but I'll read uh, the beginning of it and then uh, kind of give the gist here. Can you explain 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 8 through 12 to me? It appears to say that it's okay to mix with unchristians who, or the unchristian who commits various wrongdoings, but anyone who is a Christian that commits these wrongdoings is to be immediately removed and ignored. Uh, although in no way do I condone any of these things mentioned as we should hate what is bad, there could be misjudgments of people. Uh, were there some of these people, uh, were some of these people, I should say, given uh, time to alter their lives, to be pleasing to God and supported with help? And, and she goes on. And the basic gist of the question is, is on the one hand, or there's a couple of things in here, actually. Uh, on the one hand, it seems strange to think that we would be more tolerant of the sin of unbelievers, in a sense, than we are of believers. Why would we uh, sort of put believers out of fellowship rather than instead, uh, instead of that, um, maybe coming around them, supporting them, giving them time to change and this kind of thing. Um, and so we want to maybe take a minute and explain what's in view here uh, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm actually going to read verses, uh, I'm going to read the whole chapter actually, verses 1 through, uh, through 13. So if you've got your Bible ready, and of course I do hope you have your Bible ready, we're going to go ahead and look at chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, um, uh, and we're going to read the 13 verses, where Paul writes, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that the, uh, the one who has done these things, or this deed, I should say, might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together uh, along with my spirit and with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since uh, you truly are unleavened. For indeed it, Christ our Passover was sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral, or covetous, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those who are on the outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges, and therefore put away from yourselves the evil person. So yeah, Paul deals very directly with the fact that a very heinous sin was taking place in the midst of Corinth, on the Corinth, the Corinthian church, but it was not being dealt with. Uh, and, and a couple of things here I would point out. Let me start with something very simple and basic, but the idea that, uh, that all judgment is wrong or judgmental is not true. Some judgment is necessary. There's some of that great thunder. Uh, so uh, some judgment is right and righteous and just and necessary in order to keep a healthy body, much in the same way that your body fights off things that would do damage to it. So too, if there is, if there is something damaging within the body of Christ, it ought to be dealt with. Uh, and sometimes even in extreme ways, as Paul describes here. So that's one thing. Uh, the second thing is that the, uh, the question of whether or not uh, a person was being immediately cast out from among the believers uh, is a little bit in question. I don't know that the issue is that um, that as soon as the guy was guilty of the sin, he needed to be cast out. But rather what was going on here and what Paul is describing is the fact that not only was this sin going on, and again, a sin that is something even unbelievers were not generally accused of, and this was the idea that a man is uh, is sleeping with his father's wife. Now, the way that's the way it's spoken of there 
would seem to imply that maybe this is not the man's mother, but maybe like a second wife or something like that. So we don't really know anything else about the details there. But um, the son of this man is sleeping with this man's, uh, with his father's wife. And the other element with that is that this has been going on to the point where, it was, where Paul found out about it, and to that point, they hadn't been dealing with it. Um, now, this had to be heartbreaking for Paul because he spent 18 months with this church, we learn in the book of Acts. And even after all that time, under the tutelage of someone of the caliber of the Apostle Paul, this church, by and large, is most known for its carnality. And so uh, this is something that, again, I, as a pastor, I would imagine had to have been heartbreaking for Paul to hear that this church that is claiming to be so spiritual and even is legitimately practicing uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, they're speaking in tongues, they're prophesying, they're not practicing them legitimately necessarily, but what I'm saying is that they legitimately had those gifts. Uh, there were miracles being done. All of the gifts of the Holy Spirit seem to be in operation in this church, yet nonetheless, Whereas those should have been marks of great maturity, they actually were ironically uh, juxtaposition to the fact that they were completely immature and carnal. And so this is problematic, and therefore judgment in this case of this circumstance and their lack of dealing with it was just and right and, and necessary in order for them to be healthy. So Paul addresses this uh, and, and, and talks to them about casting this one out and even delivering him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Now, there are lots of, I shouldn't say lots, but there are varying understandings of what it means to be delivered over to Satan. But generally speaking, what is most likely in view here is that this person is uh, being, uh, it, Paul is telling the church there in Corinth to cast this one out of fellowship. Uh, so that God can deal with him outside of sort of the apparent, by silence, condoning, or at least just not feeling it was worth dealing with, of this sin by the body there in the church. Now, by the way, in the church was not just some amorphous group of people who were believers, but there were leaders in that church. There were those who had the responsibility of dealing with these things. Uh, but at whatever level, both at the... At the uh, fellow believer level, but even at the leadership level, there seemed to be no real dealing with this issue. Um, now, I should say that this can be an uncomfortable topic to deal with, not just sexual immorality, and that, that can be uncomfortable for a number of reasons, but, but even just the idea of church discipline can be difficult because nobody wants to come off as being divisive. Sometimes we just feel like we'll pray for the person and just hope that things change over time. But the Bible teaches us the importance in passages like this, or even in Matthew 18, where Jesus talks about uh, uh, discipline within uh, the assembly of believers. The idea of, uh, of going to, if you know a brother's in sin, you go to that person as a brother and you confront them about it. If they don't turn, then you bring a couple of other brothers with you and the three of you confront that person. If they still won't change, then you bring them to the leadership or you bring this to the attention of the leadership or bring the person to the leadership. The idea is that the leadership now becomes involved. And if they still will not change, then they're ultimately, um, uh, this is then to be exposed in front of the body so that when the time comes and this person then, because they will not turn, uh, is therefore excommunicated, is cast out of fellowship, um, there is a sense of understanding as to why and to what extreme uh, measures were taken to try and help this person turn from their sin, but they would not. In other words, if a person is going to continue casually in sin and not repent of it, refuse to change, then um, then there there is grounds at that point to remove this person from fellowship lest they become an influence on other believers. So this is just how a healthy body has to function at times. And I don't think Julie is necessarily, actually, I think it's obvious she's not uh, disregarding the need for church discipline. But for those who aren't familiar with this idea, I go to these lengths to kind of explain it. Now, having said all of that, um, the implication from the passage is that this has been going on and the church hasn't dealt with it. Uh, that doesn't mean that the church is unaware of it. doesn't mean that somebody hasn't confronted the guy about it. We don't really know what has gone on there. But by the time it gets to Paul, uh, Paul, who would have been aware of what Jesus had to say about these things, um, is saying it's time for this person to go. Uh, and he condemns the church for not having dealt with this uh, very directly already. And so, um, so having said all of that, it's important for us to also remember that in the body of Christ, the intention 
when it comes to church discipline and correction like this, the intention is that we would see that person change, uh, that they would recognize the error of their sin, that they would recognize that it is sin. They need to repent of that. In other words, change their mind and say, this is wrong. I don't want to continue practicing this behavior because it does dishonor the Lord. It brings shame upon the name of Christ. It, it brings shame upon the body of Christ. Uh, of course, their inaction with it also would have brought shame on the body of Christ as well. But uh, it sends the message that this is not that big of a deal. But even unbelievers were not practicing this by it. At least, you know, Paul's accusation to them is that even the unbelievers are not necessarily being accused of this kind of sin. So, of course, it's a big deal. Of course, it brings shame on the name of Christ. But the goal in, in excommunicating somebody and causing someone to be cast out of fellowship, or even to the extreme here, which, uh, again, Paul describes this as being delivered to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, um, this is so that there might be a change, that there might be a walking away from that practiced sin, and that they might instead walk with the Lord, uh, growing in sanctification, walking in holiness with the Lord. This is an important thing for believers, by the way. It's important that we do walk in holiness, that we don't take casually the idea that our behavior sends a message to people outside. And it also does displease the Lord. Sometimes because we're uh, we we understand grace so fully that these things will not cast us out of uh, out of a relation out of uh, uh, you know our relationship with God in Christ. The work is finished. We talk often about these things, but sometimes our understanding of these things is such where we actually can fall into the trap of thinking that sin's no big deal. No, it remains a big deal. All we have to do is look at the cross and understand just how big a deal our sin is. When Jesus died for past, present, and future sins, that means the ones that we might be currently committing, these are things that fell under the auspices of the paid penalty at the cross. This was the cost of these things. And so why would we want to walk in them? Uh, so walking in holiness is a big thing, and we don't just set that aside. We want to make sure that we do this so we honor the Lord, but we also recognize the power of the testimony of a holy life to those um, uh, you know, who are on the outside. Now, Paul, and speaking of those on the outside, let me address that really quickly too. Um, as Paul says in the passage, um, there is no expectation for an unbeliever to walk in holiness. There's no reason to think that they would walk in holiness. Uh, let me, this thing just popped up here. Let me shut that. There is no reason to think that um, an unbeliever would walk in holiness because they don't have the Holy Spirit living within them. They might try to live like good people from time to time, but they are still dead in their sin. They are still apart from the grace of God. And so if their behavior follows, that makes sense. So therefore, Paul is saying, I'm not telling you not to hang around uh, with unbelievers, be, with, with those who are idolaters and, and all these kinds of things or sexually immoral because you'd have to go out of the world entirely in order to do that because that is the nature of those who are in sin. However, believers have a new nature that battles against this. And so therefore, it is not excusable to uh, condone someone living uh, in, in this kind of unholiness and even just outright sin. So again, just to speak to that. Now, again, with the goal in mind being correction, people turning and repenting of that and walking with the Lord uh, in holiness and purity, leaving behind that which they, they, they have come now to understand is a big deal and is a dishonoring to the Lord, ruins their testimony, humiliates uh, or brings shame upon the name of Christ and even the church and this kind of thing. There needs to be uh, this, this willingness to change from that behavior in order to be welcomed back into fellowship, which by the way, um, is what happens in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We see where Paul tells the believers to invite this person back into fellowship and not to be harsher than was needed because we don't want to destroy this person, but rather, now that they've repented, now that they've come around, we want to bring them back into fellowship, uh, lest they, uh, you know, again, be crushed under the weight of that judgment. The goal is never to destroy but to ultimately break someone down to the point, let God break someone down to the point where they ultimately come back. Now, it's incumbent upon that person to be willing to receive that correction and instruction. Uh, matter of fact, in Proverbs 12, 1, or 12, 2, I should say, uh, um, or I'm sorry, actually it is, uh, oh, what was it? 12, 1, yes, here we go. Uh, Whoever loves instruction loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is stupid. Wow, that's a fun verse to say, huh? But the idea here of the wisdom of being willing to take correction and instruction, to be willing to hear truth spoken to you and to, where necessary, learn and grow through it. 
Um, but once they do, once that person does receive that correction and instruction, whether it be through the body, which it should have been here, or ultimately through the Lord, which it would be still through the body, but if the body is not reaching out or is incapable of reaching this person, then send them out of the body so that the Lord might sort of, um, you know, just break them down, that they might turn. And then once they do, once they receive that instruction, they repent, they come back into fellowship, and all should be back uh, back to the way it is. It should be back to normal at that point. And in the same way that Christ does not hold our sin against us anymore, uh, when the Bible says God uh, uh, has removed us from our sin, he remembers them no more. It doesn't mean that he doesn't actually remember the sin, but it means he doesn't hold it against us anymore. God can't forget things, um, but he can he can't treat us as though those things never happen. That essentially is what justification is, just as if you'd never committed that sin. You are clean now in his sight, and he no longer holds those things over your head. However, we want to make sure we don't hold it over their heads either. Once they have repented, they've come back into fellowship, we don't want to hold that over them anymore. We want to restore them fully, completely. As a matter of fact, uh, let me read this from Galatians chapter 6. Uh, verse 1, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. The idea being that we remember that there go we too, but for the grace of God. And so therefore, we want to extend that grace to a person when they are in fact, uh, ultimately, um, you know, when they when they ultimately have repented and, and are restored. We want to make sure that that is the goal, that they no longer walk in that way, but once they have repented of that, we bring them back into fellowship in that. And again, that's, that's an extreme case. Excommunicating somebody is not something that we do as a first measure. It's something that comes as Jesus described. We go to that brother. If they don't repent, we bring another couple of friends and uh, brothers with. If they still don't repent, we bring it to the leadership's attention. If they still don't repent, at that point now we start talking about removing them from the body. Um, and remember, this uh, in closing, just kind of bringing this around. Ah, uh, there's some more of that thunder. Um, the goal is always that they come back to walking with the Lord. Uh, at the end of the day, the goal is fellowship among believers and restored fellowship among believers, but also that fully restored day-to-day -day fellowship with God. You know, Jude would speak about the idea of keeping yourselves in the love of God. This doesn't speak of like losing your salvation, but rather maintaining a walk with God where you enjoy that fellowship day by day. You're not living uh, with the knowledge that you're walking in sin, and so therefore you're walking in hypocrisy and these other things that just sort of become impediments to you enjoying your relationship with God as he's called you to, but rather instead keeping yourself in the love of God, being mindful of, uh, of, of those things in your life that, that need to just sort of be repented of, turned away, and, and just you know walking with God in that fresh fullness of relationship. Um, it is a beautiful thing to consider the grace of God, um, but it's also, and, and to take advantage of the grace of God. But it's also important never to take for granted the grace of God. In other words, to consider it a light thing, a small thing. Uh, because when we do, we have to wonder if we really do understand the grace of God and appreciate it. Understand it to the point of appreciating it for what it really is. Um, I go on about that, but I'll just kind of leave that there. But just remember that when correction comes, if you're in that position now, maybe this is a good thought to end on. If you're in a place right now where you are walking in disobedience, where you're walking in sin, and you're just still trying to sort of live the Christian life and put on the face and everything, but you know you're in sin, um, remember that whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Okay? This, this is an important principle. If you didn't belong to the Lord, uh, there's sort of this understanding of kind of the parental relationship of our Father with us. We don't really correct other people's kids because they're not ours. But we do correct our own kids, and we do so because we love them, and we want them to make sure they avoid the pitfalls that sin and rebellion will bring into their lives if they walk in those ways. So out of love, we try to teach them uh, the right way to go, and when necessary, we correct them. Well, in the same way, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. And so if you're in active rebellion right now, and I don't mean there's some secret sin you're not aware of, and you suddenly need to dig deep inside yourself and, and just search out every possible. That's not what I'm saying. Sometimes we can guilt ourselves even when we're not really doing anything, but we just sort of have this self-condemning personality. That's not what I mean. What I mean is that if you know that you are living in sexual sin, 
If you know that you are being dishonest about things with people, if you know that you are uh, cheating people in some way, then be like uh, Zacchaeus who made it right with those who he had wronged. Um, that uh, we would repent of that way of being and thinking and acting and instead confess that before the Lord and say, Lord, thank you that you died for that sin. Thank you, Jesus, that I am free from the penalty of this, but I still don't want to be guilty of this anymore, doing this, actively doing this to people. I want to live differently in a way that honors you. I repent of this. I change my mind of this. Repentance is important for believers. It's a time of coming clean of our behaviors within the context of knowing that we're his sons and daughters, much again like in our own family life. This is, this is what is the ideal, even within our homes. So um, all that to try and answer this question, which again was a very, very good question, an important one. Uh, um, and again, when it comes to discipline in the church, uh, as a pastor, I mean, there have been years, uh, times over the years when I have had to uh, correct somebody, when I have had to pull somebody aside. Um, it's not fun. I, as a matter of fact, I think if, if we do enjoy that kind of thing, there's probably something wrong with us. But we, we do it because we know it's right, when it's right. And of course, we always take into account what Jesus had to say about the, the plank in our own eye and that kind of thing. I want to make sure we're not hypocritical in our judgment of things that we think are wrong. But rather instead, in love, when we see a brother or a sister uh, living in sin or rebellion or something like this, we're doing the loving thing by bringing that to their attention. Matter of fact, I'll just end with this note. I just had breakfast a little while ago with a few uh, really dear, sweet brothers uh, in our church, and we were just talking about, literally, just a couple of hours ago, we're just talking about um, what a benefit it is to have each other in fellowship because we keep each other accountable. If any one of us goes off the rails or something, one of our brothers will bring us back because they, we know that they are doing so in love. They can speak truth to us in love, and we can do this with each other. Uh, this is important for us. It's a healthy thing in a believer's life to, to have people that we will listen to when they find us in error or in sin or something like this, that they can speak to us and correct us. Uh, and we'll listen to it and repent. It's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. So anyway, hopefully that helps. Uh, might have been a little long-winded. I apologize for that. But hopefully it helps a little bit. And uh, if you have any questions or uh, anything like that that you want to share, you can do so in our comments section on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you want to go to our uh, 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 my website at parsonspad.com, you can also comment there as well. You can also send an email to info at calvarychapelfranklin.com, and I'll get those. Um, uh, and so if you have questions, sometimes uh, we'll go ahead and, and, uh, and answer them here in a, in a post. I tend to think that if you're wondering about it, probably others are as well. So this, uh, this is one example where I thought it probably would be worth spending a minute or, as it were, 22 minutes uh, answering this. So thanks, uh, Julie, for asking the question, and God bless you. So thanks, everybody, for watching and listening. And Father, we do pray that you would help us, for our part, uh, to be two things, uh, humble enough to, um, to listen if somebody sees sin in our lives or sees us going off the rails in some way and sees us in rebellion or something like that, that uh, we would be humble enough to receive that correction, uh, especially when it's offered in love. Uh, Father, help us not to resist or reject or, uh, or to get defensive or to put on a front or anything like this, but rather to receive that correction uh, and, uh, and ultimately to respond to it accordingly in a way that honors you and blesses you and, and, and keeps our fellowship pure. Uh, Father, also, when we're on the other side of it, where we have to bring correction, help us also to be humble, to make sure that we're not just being judgmental when we see something, uh, but rather when someone is actually in rebellion or open sin or something like this. Uh, help us to be willing to be used by you in that circumstance to bring a word uh, that can bring correction, but ultimately with the goal that we would see that person restored. Uh, Father, we do desire to see fellowship maintained among believers and certainly uh, to uh, enjoy all of the rich benefit of keeping ourselves in the love of God on a daily basis. And so, uh, Father, for those in leadership, uh, we pray that in our churches we would not be shy uh, about correcting error, especially when it's blatant sin, like what's described here in uh, 1 Corinthians. We pray that uh, we would seek to maintain the purity of, of love and grace and fellowship and, uh, and, and holy living among, the, among the, the saints. And so, uh, again, not to do so in a judgmental way, never to use our positions or roles uh, as leaders as, as, uh, as a means to, to, to damage people, but rather instead, even as Jesus uh, 
is, uh, it was said of Jesus, he would not uh, quench a smoldering flax or break a broken reed, but rather we would take that same kind of a mindset and seek to rebuild and to restore. Um, so, Father, with all of these things in mind, we pray that you, by your Holy Spirit, would work within us and make us this kind of people. Uh, Father, we do pray that uh, you would do this uh, for, you know, for your glory's sake and the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen.